We are back. You are chatting with John P. Today, we are going to be talking about the new watch releases from actually just this morning. If I release this video today, if it's tomorrow, then it would be yesterday. But we're going to be talking about the new watch releases so far from Watches and Wonders 2021. There are some very cool watches that I think are really exciting and really telling of the times of some really interesting things and trends that are happening in the watch industry and also there are a couple of examples here that I have in my notes that I need to just discuss with someone because I think it's a bit of a bit of a joke you know we'll get to that when uh, the time comes and I don't want to sound too negative when we, when we get to it but I think there's some things that a couple of these brands are doing that are really telling of maybe them being in dire straits and this is something i talk about in previous videos with certain brands kind of getting pushed down to compete with the micro brands uh, just based on popularity and the demand for those brands so one particular brand i have in mind we will talk about it and also yes of course i'm going to be talking about some of the rolex and tudor releases because that's what everyone wants right on the wrist today i have a gerard perigo 1966 beautiful dial the orion with that kind of aventurine beautiful gem sparkly dial you can see that at delraywatch.com also federico from federico talks watches did a uh, a bit of a hands-on review in his previous video so check that out as well um of course you can see this at delraywatch.com i don't know i'm thinking about adding this to my collection what do you think check it out and let me know also the very last watch that i'm going to talk about is a watch that i'm pretty set on adding to my collection but i bet you cannot guess what it is certainly i don't think that you would guess it for me the first brand we're going to be talking about is tudor tudor i did a video about talking what they need to do that's the some things that they need to do in order to stay relevant to stay competitive and actually make use of some of their investments throughout the last couple of years namely their movements and also the product lines including the chronograph and the BlackBerry 58, the smaller form factor size, Tudor delivered, and I'm pretty excited to see these watches in the flesh. What they announced is the BlackBerry 58 in an 18 karat gold with green, go figure. Everyone is talking green, going green, the green bezel, the green dial, 18 karat BlackBerry 58 with a display case back for $16,800. Wow, a lot for the Tudor brand, even talking, I mean, we're talking Rolex prices here, but... 16,800 for this green dial 18 karat black by 58 gold sports watch following in the same vein as Rolex when they come out with their gold sports watches and they also came out with the black bay 58 in silver sterling silver they're going to have probably some type of special uh, alloy blend so that the watch is not going to tarnish too much much like they did with the bronze Tudor watches whereas some bronze manufacturers like the Panerai with the bronzo by the way Panerai coming out with another bronzo um they Tudor does something with their alloys and it makes sense because Rolex comes out with their own proprietary metal blends to you know supposedly make them last longer make them harder this and that so that's going to be $4,300 now what do I think about these new Black Bay 58s first I'm very excited and I'm glad that Tudor came out with more watches in this smaller case size the Black Bay 58 I felt so many people really love and enjoyed even here at Delray Watch, we've spoken and worked with so many collectors and customers uh, with these Black Bay 58s, and people really like the size a lot. It's reminiscent of vintage watches, vintage Rolex, um, but also it's modern in the context of its water resistant. You can actually use it, beat it up. It doesn't have a real riv rivet bracelet. It has, you know, this faux rivet which some people criticize but for a watch that's meant to be worn you know use in the pool go to the beach i don't really see a big problem with it i did when i shot previous videos but now it just is what it is i think it's here to stay um and you can see that by the way on their new chronographs which we'll talk about but something i think tudor should not have done unfortunately they did with this 58 is they made the case backs see-through display case backs with the sapphire crystal now that's going to add a little bit of thickness to the watch maybe a half a millimeter or something like that 
okay, that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the movements are undecorated. Now I'm looking at pictures from the, the releases. Maybe they'll do some decoration, but Rolex doesn't really decorate like that, including Tudor. They don't really decorate their movements. And so when we start looking at a brand like this, that's going to try charging $16,000 for their gold watch and not have a decorated movement, I think that's kind of in poor taste but what it does show us i believe is that they're really solidifying the the part of the the segment of the industry the watch industry where they want their watches to be worn and that's kind of in their like entry level luxury range not quite as low as some micro brands might get where you start really cost cutting because i mean they are coming out with uh, a silver watch technically precious metal they are coming out with a gold watch but the see-through case back with that undecorated movement I think just really solidifies their plans for the Tudor brand going forward. I speculated in previous videos, you know, is Tudor going to become the new Omega? If they're not decorating their movements, I certainly don't think so. And it's very telling. Tudor also came out with these Panda in the reverse Panda um, dual register or, or by register chronographs, 14.4 millimeters in thickness. So a little bit slimmer than the case sizes of their previous chronographs, but they put the, um, the a different movement inside to make it thinner i can understand that the other um black bay chronographs or the heritage chronographs were kind of clunky i felt in my opinion so slimming it up a little bit going in the direction of the 58 in terms of compactness i think is really great at 5225 so 5225 us dollars on a bracelet you know we're talking uh not quite a third, but between a third and a half of the price of the retail price of a Daytona looks like a Daytona acts like a Daytona 200 meter water resistance. I think people are going to eat this up. What do you think? Leave it in the comments below. Yes. Let's go to Rolex. Let's get Rolex out of the way. There were so many, so much speculation that Rolex was going to put a ceramic bezel on their Explorer too. They didn't do that. They updated the movement. They put in the 3285 movement, which is the same movement they started putting in uh, a handful of years ago into their GMT Master 2. And so they put that movement in there. That's really the only change up. The coronet at the 12 o'clock, I, I think they, they changed a little bit or made it smaller. There's really no other changes besides that. Some people were kind of upset because they wanted that ceramic bezel. I don't know if it really made a whole lot of sense considering the other ceramic bezel alternatives and, op and options. I mean, what, what would be the point there? I wouldn't really understand that. So some people were let down, but at the same time, some people were really excited because Rolex is coming out with the Explorer or what some people kind of refer to as the Explorer 1, you know, because of the smaller case size but really also not the the external bezel um, with the with the numbers on it this explorer one is coming back with a 36 millimeter k size and also it's going to be a two-tone option and the pricing on this for the stainless steel is six thousand four hundred and fifty and at two-tone just north of ten thousand so ten thousand eight hundred dollars so i think the pricing's in line with their other offerings to see the explorer one in 36 i think is pretty great it probably allows rolex to plan for the future because now that the oyster perpetual 39 is discontinued when they start talking about movements going forward into the future and also case components and construction and the tooling and the different things that they use manufacturing they can probably use a lot of that from the op 36 because the 39 is discontinued so i, I can see them going in that direction uh, but I don't know. What do you guys think about these Rolex announcements? Also, you know, apparently the, um, you know, now you can get the Oyster Flex on different Daytona. There's a couple of uh, bracelet and strap option changes. You also have a Datejust 36 with, I, I think, by the way, this is their coolest release. You have a Datejust 36 with this kind of uh, palm tree motif for uh, design on the dial in green. I think it's pretty cool uh, picture here. What do you guys think about this? A uh, bit of an under the radar in terms of the release, but I, I think it's just really great. Some people are going to look over it because it's 36, but I think it's just so unique and kind of off the cuff from the brand. Moving on to Patek Philippe. Now this one kind of unexpected but if you really think about what's going on in the industry not really Patek Philippe coming out with a green dial Nautilus 5711 
okay, yeah, the Nautilus is supposed to be discontinued, in 5711 rather, supposed to be discontinued, but they said, you know, maybe they're going to come out with something in the interim. They did. Green dial. Wow, go figure. Everyone's doing green dials. That's going to be uh, a theme here, I think, for a while. Everyone wants a green dial, starting kind of, you know, with that Hulk. You have green dial everything. You know, got the Tudor with the green dial. Now you got the Patek Philippe 5711 with the green dial. I don't see where it ends. I'm a little shocked to see it from Patek Philippe because they tend to do whatever they do and hope the market kind of follows them. But now we kind of see them caving to the market, coming out with the green dial. They didn't need to do that. They could have made this dial in the most putrid of orange colors. And people probably would have lined up outside their local authorized dealers to buy this thing. It could have been baby food yellow and people would have bought this for sure and been on the waiting list and probably paid triple retail price. But they gave everyone the green that they wanted. $34,893 US plus tax. What do we think about this? Are you going to try to get on the waiting list or are you not going to waste your time? Let me know. Comments below. Going with the, the same kind of trail of thought in the same color tones, we have green once again, but green in a different way. Panerai has two, well, they, they have a couple of releases, but the two big releases they have feature this new steel called the E-Steel. Now, green not being color, but green being kind of the movement of making things eco-friendly. That's the E in E-Steel. Panerai is now going, they're more than doubling down. I mean, they were supporting a lot of like um, philanthropic um, causes, trying to clean up the ocean, things like that. Now they're kind of doubling, tripling down on this E-Steel, which has a certain amount of the steel in the components in the watch actually being from recycled materials. They came out with the, the, a new Luminor Marina, the 44 millimeter kind of quintessential Panerai. This is uh, going to be comprised of, I think, roughly 50 or in that range, 50% recycled materials. But the price is now $8,700. But that's not even the kicker. They have this new submersible the Panerai Luminor Submersible called the E-Lab ID, much like the Lab IDs, kind of, you know, their alternative materials line that Panerai has been coming out with, different forms of uh, alternative ways of constructing the cases and the components inside these watches. Panerai has been doing that for a while. Now they have this E-Lab, which is almost entirely, you know, it's, it's, it's within a negligible range, but it's almost entirely composed or constructed of recyclable materials everything top to bottom the pam 01225 but this is a sixty thousand dollar watch so as i started thinking about this you know recycled materials that sounds really nice right it's eco-friendly i mean i could get behind that i can support that what's wrong with that but when you start thinking about this sixty thousand dollar watch if you start creating watches that are sixty thousand dollars but are much more friendly for the environment. Does that change the watch industry? Or is Panerai actually buying the materials from you know places that recycle these materials, making the same exact components that they would have otherwise using the same machining and tooling or using the contract manufacturers to use this materials, getting a huge discount on these uh, components and then charging this huge premium for what we see as a bit of a trend or a marketing thing, much like we're seeing Hublot use this NFT and, you know, uh, sending Jean-Claude's watch off to auction with the NFTs, kind of a money grab situation. Sometimes, arguably, in some people's opinions, is that what Panerai is doing with their recyclable materials? I'm not sure. Is anyone willing to pay a premium for what seems to be otherwise a pretty much cookie cutter Panerai watch, but they put a little E on the front to let you know that yes, for $60,000, you are saving the world. I don't know. I think it'd be interesting to see who buys these. Leave it in the comments below if you're lining up to, uh, to buy $60,000 Panerai. Love to hear it and love to see it. Next, not that exciting of a Mont Blanc release, but I really like this watch. This is the Geosphere 1858 Gobi Desert in Bronze Limited Edition. Now, the Gobi Desert is a desert that kind of runs between China and Mongolia. It's famous. It's really large. People like to go there and trek through the desert. This watch, the Geosphere line, is kind of a trekking watch with the different functions and features and 
certainly the way that they advertise this product out in the market. You see it on like explorers and people going through waterfalls. I get it. That's kind of where they're going with the Mont Blanc, the mountains. That's the theme of the brand going forward. Even in their dress watches, they like to emphasize mountains. Uh, I get it. It's, you know, their positioning, much like Panerai is saving the oceans in the world. Mont Blanc is climbing mountains. And what I just really love about this watch is that there's actually a picture of uh, the Gobi Desert on the back of the watch. I mean, you know, typically you have a watch that might put something that you would see in a desert, but there's nothing in the desert. So what could you really engrave into the case back besides actually putting a picture of a desert on the case back? I don't know. I think for $6,500, it could be a little bit steep, but we're talking bronze. We're talking something unique. There's going to be people out there, maybe even in the Chinese markets, because the desert is there. It's kind of a landmark. It's an icon to that part of the world. Maybe that's the market Mont Blanc is going for, trying to kind of jump in and get a piece of the Chinese market. I'd love to see it. I don't know. We'll see how this one plays out. I really do think the desert on the back of the watch is pretty cool. Would I put my money on this one and add it to my collection. I think there's a lot of other really great things, so probably not, but they might be going for a particular market in a particular clientele. Next, we have Cartier. Cartier has a new Privé, uh, interesting offering, but also what I think is probably their biggest offering is they're coming out again with the Mustang Cartier. The Cartier tank was kind of an entry level in the 80s, I believe early 90s as well it was kind of a quartz they had a manual wine version but they had a quartz driven uh the mustang cartier watch and it was and it was entry level i believe at the time maybe you could buy the watch for 500 dollars so maybe 25 percent of their lowest price tank solo offering today makes sense just looking at the prices of watches going up over time but they have unique colorways. i think they have a yellow a blue a red um, I'm sure they'll have limited editions. I didn't see pricing on this one, but many people are excited about it because it's kind of that nostalgia, the nostalgia of someone, you know, whatever it is, buying that uh, affordable Cartier, Mustang Cartier tank on eBay for, you know, $300 when they were younger or something like that. I could see that. I know a lot of people in the community that kind of just had a Mustang Cartier in their collection because it was really approachable. And you even can see it today, but the prices have gone up as Cartier has made a name for themselves in watches. They're coming back out with it. The excitement is alive on this one. You can see it in the comments section of different videos and uh, articles on some web blog websites. Check it out. This one I think is one to watch. Lastly, here is a watch that I am pretty excited for. And it's a brand that I think does some pretty great things and has increased their quality to keep up with some of the best in the segment. And I think they might just be the best in their segment. This is an Oris. Many of you like Oris. And this is the Oris Cotton Candy Bronze 38. Now, looking at the pictures, I get it. This is probably geared with the colors. It's probably geared towards a certain type of customer. It's in the smaller case size. You know, they are going more unisex with this one. They, they are, you know, arguably using colors that may gravitate traditionally or historically towards ladies' watches. Now this is kind of unisex. And I am proud to say that I would easily add the blue or the green into my personal collection. I think it's cool. I think it's unique. I think the contrast between the bronze and either the blue or the green is just really nice. It's interesting. It does look like cotton candy. And just the mixing of those two colors that bronze with the, the blue and the green, I don't really know how to describe it in artistic or design terminology, but there's something about it that I think really is just interesting without being over the top. In addition, it's a pretty great watch. I mean, it does have a Salita movement, but I think it's comparable to something you would see coming out of a Tudor Black Bay 58. You know, sure, it's a little bit smaller in size, but it's in that same realm. It's $2,600, but it's 100 meters water resistance. It comes on a bronze bracelet of course there's a stainless uh clasp part of the clasp is stainless i imagine just uh because of the tooling required and maybe even just the strength of the materials but uh, the case is bronze with the exception of the case back and the rest of the watch is bronze so i think for 2600 dollars to get spec for spec probably par for 
that range of watches, something unique on the dial. That's probably why I will add this watch to my collection. I think it launches in June. So, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll literally not want it anymore. That's kind of what's going on. Uh, with watches, right? And that's kind of a comment I, I do want to, to mention and see if any of you agree with me because as I look at some of these releases, responses to the releases, as and as well as things that people wanted to see in the releases pre-release, all the chatter, the gossip, the talking, the wish lists, the photoshopping, but also seeing how the brands responded and delivered on some of these things, including Patek Philippe with the green dial, I personally think we're getting into an era of watch collecting where the bars being set so high, but not only by the consumer and the collector, but also by the brands because they're delivering on these things. And in some cases they are over delivering on some of these things that we as watch collectors want. So as we start looking into the future, start going into the future, what are the brands going to do? They're setting the bar so high every year and even throughout the year, everyone's waiting to see what the recent release is. Are the brands going to be able to keep up with this high bar, this high level of uh, just demand that the consumers are placing on them for innovation, right? Looking at the movements, if they don't update a Rolex movement every year, people with pitchforks are after the brand. If there's not a longer power reserve. If there's not better components, better manufacturing, consumers kind of get a little bit angry in the comments section. I see it on these videos. And so I wonder if we'll get to a point and that point may be here now where there's innovation in the movements and the watch construction for just the point of innovation, right? Curious to hear your comments and opinions, leave it below. Guys, please do not forget the thumbs up, like, and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. You can check out delraywatch.com where we have so many cool new watches just on the other side of this wall that I'm always pointing to. Also leave down below anything else that I may have missed in this video. So many other things were released, but I couldn't talk all day because I actually do have to do uh, a bit of work here today at Delray Watch, believe it or not. Thanks, guys. You've been chatting with John P. Ciao.